Welcome to Policy Brief, an informed and engaging conversation with policymakers, policy influencers, and public service professionals, brought to you by the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University. My name is Trevor Brown. I'm Dean at the Glenn College, and I am privileged to be joined today by Council President Shannon Harden of the City of Columbus. Council President Harden, thanks for joining us today. Dean, thank you so much for allowing me to be here and have this great conversation. Looking forward to it. So let's start by talking about Columbus. Columbus is a city on the rise, um, growing dynamically, big forecast for, for exceptional growth. Uh, and then all of a sudden, COVID hit. Uh, some other cities around the state, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and others have had to take some pretty drastic economic steps, furloughing workers, et cetera. But to this point, Columbus hasn't. What is it about Columbus that's allowed us so far to weather this, um, this onslaught from, from COVID? Yeah, well, well, I think that, that that's a good question. And I wish I would, could say that we were um, going to be universally and definitely immune to some of the things that we have seen around the state and around the country. I don't believe that's totally the case. However, I do believe that we are different in some uh, in instances and truthfully those differences have um, have always been there and really have um, put us on the trajectory uh, that the, that we are on now uh, to uh, be the 14th largest city in the country to have a expected uh, growth in population of anywhere between 500,000 to a million people over the next 20 or 25 years um, and to have such a strong uh, uh, economy leading into the um into the the crisis uh i think what what has uh, led us to that that point is that we have a pretty diversified economy um we have a state government that is uh, uh headquartered here um we have uh large employers that are um a lot of, of white collar uh employment um uh, like OSU, like uh, Battelle, we have uh, the uh, insurance uh, industry that is, is strong. Um, we have research that, that is strong. And um, a, a lot of what, what those industries have in common though, even though they're diversified, is that uh, the effects of that, uh, of the coronavirus, uh, in terms of not being able to uh, go into a physical location um, certainly hurt and we were none, none of us were used to it, but a lot of those industries were able to pretty effectively pivot uh, to work at home situations. Um, thus, they were have not did not do uh, immediate large uh, layoffs. Other communities around the state and certainly around the country that have, rely on different types of industries, uh, say um, manufacturing or say uh, um, uh, travel or tourism, um, those uh, communities ha were hit right right away uh, and uh, immediately and have seen the effects of that. In Columbus, uh, we, we have not. One of the other things, in, in Ohio, I, I point this out to, to folks, um, Ohio uh, cities um, get a majority of our, our revenue from income tax. Uh, that is actually a very unique uh, circumstance uh, we make up 2% uh, na nationally of cities that are actually funded uh, primarily from income tax. So to believe that um, the uh, economic downturn will not touch Columbus would be silly um, uh, to, to, to think that these would not catch up to us. Just today, uh, it was released that another 2.1 million people lost their jobs last week. Uh, that will catch up to Columbus. Um, some of the differentiators in terms of how we've had to respond, um, truthfully, is that uh, we have had we have reserves. Um, we have not had to, to tap into them yet. We have received uh, we we have uh, nearly uh, eighty five million dollars in our rainy day fund. We have another twenty five million dollars uh, set aside in basic city service fund, which was all which we always do uh, to to kind of cushion just in case there are things that come up along the year. Uh, and then since the uh, pandemic hit, uh, came to, uh, made its way through Columbus, 
uh, we found ourselves doing a lot of cost saving uh, uh, techniques, of course, like cutting travel, halting uh, hiring that has saved another $25 million. So we have about $135 million, $140 million buffer um, that, that uh, we have uh, when we uh, see, the, see the, the job loss catch up to, to Columbus. Um, but we're not there yet. And the last differentiator that I would want to highlight and something that as uh, the executive committee of the National League of Cities, which represents 19,000 cities across the, the country, is that Columbus was the only city in our state that was large enough, qualified for uh, CARES Act stimulus money from the federal government. Uh, the criteria was that a city had to have a population above 500,000 people. We do which meant that we got, re the city of Columbus received $157 million uh, that can be spent on COVID related uh, expenses. Um, I think all of these things will um, help us weather some parts of the storm, uh, but know the storm will affect us financially. Uh, and and uh, speaking with, uh, she is a, a, our auditor, but also a professor at, the, at your school. My good friend, Megan Kilgore, uh, she will be making uh, budget uh, reassessments uh, in June um, that will kind of give us a clearer, a better picture of what the second half of the year will look like. Um, but uh, but we do know that it will catch up with us. I just think that we will be able to weather a little bit better. All right. So that was a great overview of the course of our conversation. And I want to talk about each of those pieces, uh, yes, come sir. back to some of those financial elements, in particular the interconnections between the federal government, the state government, and, and Columbus, because I know there are flows of revenues across those. But, yes. but let's talk about, you, you, you described one of the reasons that we were able to, to at least weather the initial brunt financially of, of COVID was the ability of employers to pivot to virtual work. Yeah. What about the city of Columbus? It's a significant, I mean, how many employees are there? Eight, we nine? have nearly 9,000 employees. How do you, how do you, turn off the lights on, on a city of eight to 9,000 and go fully virtual or, or largely virtual in, in the delivery. And, and then after that, I wanna hear a little bit about the role that council plays. So just talk just about the process by which you went virtual as a city. Well, first you have to assess and understand that uh, even in a shutdown, even in a, uh, a, a slowdown, that some things have to continue. Uh, police have to continue to protect and keep our community safe. Fire has to be ready to respond to any danger. Uh, trash has to continue to be picked up. Water services have to continue to be cleaned and, and purified uh, and made available. And so what we have to do first is uh, figure out who is, what is essential uh, and, and see what do we have to uh, continue to keep moving along uh, even in this heightened security state and safety state. And what we found was that out of our 9,000 employees, about 7,200 of them still needed to engage, still needed to work. And so we weren't a good example of folks that, um, that, that uh, could stay at home. So a, major a majority of our folks had to continue to, to work and we are very, very appreciative of them, especially our healthcare workers who worked uh, day in, day out, um, really before the public knew that their crisis was here, but had already been meeting, working in an emergency um, posture. Uh, and so first we figured out who, who we had to keep going. Uh, then we uh, slowly pulled back those offices in coordination and in, um, in, in concert with um, the guidelines of the state government. Um, what, what, what was interesting in terms of how you communicate or, or what is interesting and, and for us, you know, uh, the mayor uh, came to us uh, a week or a couple of days before we went to the public to ask to say that he thought it was time to go into a state of emergency. Um, communication is key and critical in uh, times of emergency because sometimes the fear of our language and our actions uh, can create more of an issue than the, the concern of why we're going into the emergency in the first place. And so we were very um, cautious in our, in our uh, language. We had to balance uh, expressing to the public that this was a dire uh, health situation that we were entering and thus we needed them to take things seriously and that, that we needed them to listen to the advice that we were getting from our health um, 
uh, advisors, our, our health officials, but we also couldn't incite panic. Uh, and so uh, we were very thoughtful about uh, how the how we rolled out the mayor's emergency um, powers and resolutions. So you've been you've been saying we in there, and I, I assume you mean we being the council. The city council, um, yes. Yeah, so talk a little bit about the council's role. So the gov or sorry, the, the mayor came to you and said, I think it's time that we need to enter into um, these emergency protocols. What is the council's formal role um, in in affirming or, uh, or what role do you play? Well, what we did was um, one, we, we did our first kind of WebEx meeting, Zoom meeting and pulled in the city attorney's office, myself as council president and the mayor, uh, and uh, talked through what, it, what, those, what those powers would be. What we understood under the uh, powers that are articulated in our city code is that under a state of emergency that the mayor declared, he would have the ability to uh, make any expenditure that was specific to, related to the emergency that was at hand, um, and that had to be articulated. Uh, and so we all I talked to my council members. Uh, we agree, truthfully, um, the mayor can go into that state of emergency with, with or without our approval anyways. We felt that it was important, though, to show a, a level of um, strong, uh, a, unif a unified front that, that we were on board with this. And so we, uh, that same day, passed a resolution in support of the mayor's actions and the health commissioner's actions. Now, those, those that the emergency power allows for, again, expenditures specifically related to and have to be articulated the connection to the crisis, which meant the council, council still has to play the critical role of everything else that has to happen. And so uh, what we started uh, early on was, um, even though the mayor did not need and, and does not need currently under the emergency uh, powers to come to ask us uh, about expenditures related to, to, to COVID, uh, that uh, every week that he would uh, uh, share those with us, the, the last week's um, uh, expenditures, so that we um, would know how the city's dollars were, were being held. And, and again, you know, when you have a, 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 a government, there's checks and balances. Our check was to make sure that those expenditures really were specifically COVID-related. And we felt, we, we felt very comfortable that, those, that that's how it's been happening. So... Um, Perhaps this is another example of what we hear of as the Columbus Way, often framed as the partnership between public and private, but here it's executive and legislative collaboration. And um, that's that's very heartening to hear as a student of democracy. It's it's really unique too, I'll say. So so <laughs> I get to be, I'm I am a part of a group of large city council presidents from around the country, uh, the top twenty largest metropolitan cities. Uh, we meet and we started meeting the first week of the coronavirus, every Friday at four o'clock on, on a Zoom, specifically to talk about how do you work with, because everybody was in the very the exact same situation. Um, how do you work with uh, uh, your administration, the administration, your chief executive under these emergency powers? And what I found was that we, uh, your point, we did it, we were doing it better in terms of partnership, true mm -hmm. partnership, not not turning our, our or closing our eyes or shutting down council, but uh, daily communication, daily interaction, decisions being made in concert and in tandem together, uh, almost better than anybody that I heard around the country. Sometimes very so, proud of. So this may be frivolous, but it's something I'm sure some of our listeners and viewers will be keen to know. We have two executives, it sounds like, in the city of Columbus. We have the mayor and then you, the council president. And we often think of the title of president as an executive, and you could see that that might cause some conflict. Describe for us, what is, why is that title there? Why are you referred to as council president? And, and what does that formally mean in terms of the distribution of responsibilities between the executive, the mayor, and the representative body, the, the council? Well, it certainly is confusing to my six-year-old nephew who uh, thinks that I am president of the city of Columbus and uh, proudly tells his kindergarten class that uh, any chance he gets. Uh, but it is important um, that in our code, we have a strong mayor system. Um, the mayor is the chief executive of our city. I liken it to a business. He is the chief operating officer. What I am is the chairman of the board of directors. Uh, so the mayor has to come to us, uh, to council, to uh, get a, approval 
for any expenditures that he makes. And likewise, we can come up with programming as well, but we need his signature uh, most time. Uh, actually, we need his signature to, to, to move that, that, that process through. My job as a, uh, we are a co-equal branch of government uh, where um, uh, my job is really almost administrative in that uh, I have six other council members. Um, they are all independently elected, elected officials. My job is to make sure that the communication between the uh, executive branch and the legislative branch is clear, concise, and that we too run our uh, our offices, our council, uh, in a, in uh, in a way that um, uh, is efficient. the The mayor has the oversight, the employment, um, the ability to hire and fire of the not, the nine thousand employees that we have. Uh, our job is is to work in concert to make sure that that he's able we're able to fund those uh, priorities that we come up to come up with collectively, uh, and that we hold hold uh, the oversight responsibility over the the rest of the government. So you just very clearly explained the important role that you play as the representative body. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had your first WebEx meeting a while back, um, and, and I presume that that entailed more than just a communication, that you've now formally run council meetings virtually. Um, yeah. And, and I, I want you to both explain sort of how that works. But also, I want you to step back a little bit. I mean, there's a large national debate about moving voting procedures broadly to virtual delivery, right? I mean, so there's a debate within Congress right now about whether senators and House members can vote virtually and different sides of that. But also there's a, a larger discussion about whether the populace can be um, participate in the voting process without actually going in and voting, vote by mail and, and other opportunities. Um, so this question about the council is part of this larger discussion mm -hmm. about in a democratic system, which at core choice and choice exercise by the voter is so privileged and so important. How do you ensure as you move council virtually that you, you know, you keep that, that process sacrosanct. Well, you're a hundred percent right. It's, uh, it's fundamental and foundational to everything that we do that the public be able to engage and not just engage, not to just to watch. We're not putting on a TV show, uh, but to criticize, critique, ask questions, get in real time responses, uh, or even beforehand, before we, as we consider legislation, before we take votes, the ability to to um, to work with their elected officials uh, as we consider uh, how we spend their tax money, and so you know, for us, it, it, you know, we could not the 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 function of the city had to continue, which meant that we had to continue to 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 vote. The meetings that we uh, we did. Um, we are currently uh, doing are only possible right now under the the governor's um, uh, state of emergency. Um, right now, the the governor put out a state of emergency that allowed for um, not just cities, but all the way down to townships and our zoning boards to meet virtually. Um, that was passed and supported by the uh, the state uh, the state house uh, and and. Um, and gave us this uh, ability, but that expires on Jan uh, at the end of this year. Uh, and so uh, what was really important to me, to your point, was that we had that capacity. The, the interesting thing is, is that we, these, some of these platforms, the city had, had purchased many years ago, we just weren't using them. And so it was interesting to learn in real time the capacity that we actually did have to, to operate in a virtual state and to allow, um, the members of the, the public to participate as well. And so uh, we were very quickly, and this is something I'm very proud of, the technology department for allowing or uh, helping us to, to figure out, but also to council staff. Um, we, have, we, from our very first meeting that we went virtual, um, folks have been able to uh, speak on any piece of legislation. They can virtually speak on any piece of legislation. Um, they can uh, uh, still do uh, written uh, responses engagement. We post our, we've been posting our uh, meeting agenda so folks know exactly what is on the agenda uh, earlier so that folks can um, uh, weigh in uh, beforehand. And so uh, it's been a really good engagement and, and, and learning process truthfully as we go. 
And truth, and also, um, even though we recommend that folks don't come in person to council, we have never legally prohibited folks coming to city council. So we also have that backstop as well. And so I think that safety considerations are, for me, would be the biggest concern. We, we saw the first few days of the crisis when folks were having these Zoom attacks, uh, where, where folks would, would hijack meetings. Um, because we're using a secured uh, system um, that is powered by Microsoft, which is specific to um, uh, government agencies, and I think uh, larger institutions, other folks use uh, the Microsoft WebEx technology. Uh, we have not seen that that issue, uh, and but but do monitor for that. So you, I'm so pleased that you gave the sort of legal architecture for why this was able to happen, the governor's orders, et cetera. So with that in mind, there, there's so many organizations, the university where I serve, and you're explaining here about how you've been able to achieve functionality. It's been able to work, and, and in some ways, maybe it's been enhanced. People who couldn't physically come to a council meeting may be able to virtually participate. Let's fast forward a little bit and imagine that the crisis is over and the emergency order is no longer in place. Did you envision any push to move meetings like this virtually or create more opportunities for citizens to engage virtually in local governance, um, things that we're learning now through COVID? I heard a term uh, this week, Tuesday, uh, finding our new better normal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking, I will be looking, and I think we all should be re respective, regardless of where we come from, uh, personally or professionally, understanding that there will be a new normal after we come out of this, but let's find the better new normal. Uh, and so uh, I, I would be open to some conversations on that. I do think there is, um, we, we will all be eager to get back to a more regular footing. But what I have found uh, over the last several weeks is that um, we've, we held a, we, our first virtual town hall meeting. We had uh, nearly 5,000 people participate. Uh, even in our most heated council uh, uh, hearings, which usually have to do with zonings, um, you never get more than 50, 60 people. Um, then now this might be a function that we were under a crisis and it might be a function that more people were at home and had the ability to and understood or we had them as a captive audience. Uh, but you can't turn away from that uh, type of engagement uh, very easily. And so I think that it will be a mixture going forward of uh, both in-person and more virtual. I think we may have trained a new group of folks uh, on, um, we, are, we all are gonna have a higher, greater capacity as it pertains to, to technology. And I think that we would all be smart to continue to lean into that. So we're, we're beginning to move the conversation by looking forward. And there are a couple other topics I wanted to talk. So I'm gonna put you on the spot and have you weave some of these to, together. Um, so earlier you described the, the lucky situation or good planning that resulted in the fortuitous situation that Columbus was in financially going into the um, uh, going into the crisis. And part of that was the partnership between the federal government, Federal CARES Act, uh, state support. We have state government here in, in the city of Columbus. And so just by being here, that provides an employment boost, et cetera. Um, as you look forward uh, and you think about the next stages of the pandemic, how critical are those partnerships, that relationship between federal and state, federal, local, state and local? Um, and then after that, I'm going to ask you a few questions about leadership. And we'll, we'll finish up there and thinking about, you mentioned communication. So just as you're, as you're preparing your response, know that we'll, we'll talk about that here, here at the end. But just how critical are those relationships between the different entities of government? You know, I'll start on the local level and go up. Um, we have trained, we are trained in Columbus, uh, under the, the Columbus way as a mantra, but more as a, uh, governing ethos, um, that we approach big issues together in a collaborative way, because truthfully, we know that we can't effectively solve the issues, uh, uh any other way. And so for us in Columbus, I think it's natural uh, at this point. And that crosses public, private, uh, uh, and certainly uh, intra-elected uh, and intra-government on the local level. Um, what was uh, greatly appreciated, heartening, um, and what certainly saved lives was that partnership 
uh, that Columbus way almost bu bubbled up to an Ohio way um, throughout the pandemic. And so right away, uh, we were in close coordination and, co and, and conversations with the state government. Uh, most of this was administrative functions um, through the health department, working our local health department, working with the Ohio Department of Health and the mayor working with the governor. I can tell you the mayor, uh, to even uh, to this day, has a daily phone call with the governor. Um, I think it's the, the five or six larger cities in Columbus, maybe it's the eight larger cities in Ohio, talk to the governor for uh, every day for an hour. I talk to the mayor then afterwards, they, they do the press conference and we're able to get, keep communications clear. Um, one of the things um, that because we the partnership was so strong and because we felt that the, the coordination of the efforts were um, going well from the state level, We've worked, we've worked to make sure that all of our guidelines have been in step with, um, with, with the state government. And so that has been helpful, the Ohio way. I wish I could say that there was an American way that uh, was strong as, uh, strung together and as closely coordinated and focused as um, the Columbus and the Ohio way. Uh, I think that, uh, what we again, we were we were appreciative that we received that 157 million dollars in the care, in the initial stimulus dollars to, to cities. Uh, we we would be uh, we need those dollars to fill feed fill the 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 hole. What we do have and what we work really closely with was our our congressional delegation. Um, early on, we were on, in conversations with uh, our Congresswoman Beatty. Um, uh, with uh, our senators, both uh, Sherrod Brown and, and Rob Portman, everybody pretty from pretty much was pretty aligned. Um, one of the, the the one example of this was um, the, the first PPP uh, program, Paycheck uh, Protection Program, rolled out. Um, didn't have as much success getting to smaller businesses as anyone expected or anybody wanted. And so working with the with our uh, local delegation um, and uh, our, our senators, we're, we're able to, to fashion a, a, a better program for the second round. Um, and I thought that was that was helpful and it was a and it was good for good, good relationship. So those are great examples. And you mentioned some exceptional public servants in there elected and uh, throughout the conversation. Um, those who, who serve um, in unelected positions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, made reference to them, if not by name, and, and you don't need to name names. But what you, you've had the privilege of being able to see a lot of people in leadership roles, whether they be in formal roles like an elected official, but also I would imagine you've seen a lot of people on the front lines exercising leadership in the medical sector or the economic sector. What, as you think about what's happened to date, and, and as you imagine going forward, what do you see as the critical? sort of leadership requirements. You mentioned communication earlier. What do, what do you think are the essence of effective leadership in this time of, of crisis? You know what? I think it is um, communication, 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 and clarity in that communication. Um, why we collectively as a state um, managed through this, I believe, was because of the daily uh, briefings that uh, Governor DeWine and uh, Dr. Acton uh, gave to us. They, in, in um, clear, um, in a, uh, uh, as clear as can be, and in a uh, calm and reassuring way, uh, provided comfort and confidence that even though what we were going through we had never seen before, um, it was very serious, was very dire, that they understood the, the nature and the, the severity of the issue, but also that they had been working on and were providing us with details of a plan. They were also clear about what they did not know. I think that uh, folks see through, folks aren't, especially when you're dealing with the pandemic, uh, especially when you're dealing with something that had never been seen before. I think folks see that uh, we are um, like they are. We might have a little bit of information a little bit before them, uh, the rest of the public, but uh, they knew that, and they know um, during moments of crisis, they don't expect perfection. They expect to be told the truth, uh, and they they want to uh, follow uh, whoever has the best information. And so, um, having clarity in information, being honest and open when we did don't didn't or don't have the full information, um, but but coming from a posture of planning uh, and process. 
uh, I think is, is critical and key uh, in managing. Uh, you have to keep the populace um, along with you. Um, government, uh, you know, we, we rule, we, we, we lead by consent of the, of the public. Um, they have to consent and agree to uh, these uh, uh, social constructs, these the, the, the idea of, of government, and and that is not an, an action of a force; it's an action uh, of confidence, of of um, uh, giving them the best information and asking them to come along. And I think that we've seen a lot of that um, from the state and local government leaders. That's a that's a great way to end this, and and we could keep talking. I know for for hours. And in fact, I'm I'm already planning a, your return some months from now when we are, are at a different stage of uh, of this uh, pandemic. Um, it's really been a pleasure to, to to learn about how the city council works and how Columbus has weathered this. So, Council President Harden, thanks so much for making time, and um, we won't tell your nephew that you're not really the president. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole generation of kindergartens out there who are going to have a messed up understanding of, uh, of government structure. Well, that's the job of the Ohio State University. And the yeah, we're going to send them right there. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll provide that civics education. Thank you so much, Dean. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't say I've appreciated the Columbus way, the public par uh, partnership with, with your um, with your school uh, in providing uh, Glenn, we call them Glenn turns. Um, to Columbus City Council, um, funded uh, in partnership with this uh, city and with uh, this uh, with the Glen College, uh, we really appreciate it. They have um, built out real programs that are running in the city of Columbus, and we're very appreciative of that of that real time actionable uh, education that you're giving to our community. Well, not, another example of the Columbus, and as you put it, the Ohio way. We we love partnering. So, thanks again. We we'll look forward to seeing you back here some other time. Stay healthy. Take care.